Dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us today. It's an extreme pleasure for me to uh, see, first of all, all of you in this audience. Today we start the new project of the Canon Institute in Kiev, which will last for the next three months. And this is the Canon Lecture Series, which is uh, made possible with a very generous moral, intellectual and financial assistance from the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. And we are, of course, very pleased that the America House, which has opened quite recently, uh, was kind enough to host us here in this very comfortable location. And we hope that as our lectures will develop and evolve, more people will learn from you about this very nice intellectual setting. And starting from next week, when Natalia Musienka, who is present in this room today and who is a curator of the Art of the Maidan exhibition and the one who will speak about cultural diplomacy next week will have a bigger audience with an assistance from you as our major ambassadors of the Canon Lecture uh, series. Uh, I'm also very pleased that by pure coincidence, our deputy director from our Washington's office, uh, Will Pomeranz, uh, is with us today. Uh, Dr. Pomeranz is also teaching at the Georgetown University. He is a lawyer by training and he is, specializes in Russian history, in the in history of the Russian law. Will, would you please uh, say a couple of words about the Canon Institute and about the Canon Institute Kiev office? Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Katya, and uh, Katya is going to talk about George F. Kennan, the man, but I do get to talk about the Institute, <laughs> the Kennan Institute. Uh, the Kennan Institute is a part of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, the Wilson Center is the living memorial to Woodrow Wilson, the only U.S. president who also was a scholar with a Ph.D. Uh, the goal of the Wilson Center is to serve as a bridge between the world of ideas and the world of action. Um, as such, it tries to link, link scholars to practitioners. And the Kennan Institute is the oldest and the largest program within the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, it has uh, been around for more than 40 years, and it is a leader in the study of Ukrainian, Russia, and Eurasian affairs. Uh, and it also focuses attention for policymakers, the academic community, journalists, and U.S. government uh, uh, representatives on this region uh, and make sure that we understand the culture and the history and all the different aspects that have gone into, uh, into creating uh, this important part of the world. Uh, the Kennan Institute uh, has a variety of programs. You can visit it on, on the website, uh, but we have various scholarships, uh, publications, and a very active lecture series. Uh, we also have regional offices. Uh, we have a representative in Moscow and we're extremely proud of all the work that all the work that Katya has done here in Kiev to revitalize the institute and to really help it serve as a platform for ideas and for developments inside uh, Ukraine. Uh, I would also like to echo Katya's thought and thank the embassy for supporting this important new initiative and uh, the, and the and the America House for uh, hosting it. Um, I think Katya will give a interesting overview about George F. Kennan, the diplomat. Uh, he does have a profound legacy. Uh, he is remembered as a scholar, as a diplomat, as an ambassador, and as a critic. And I think all those aspects of his life uh, formed the man, and I think he has a profound legacy uh, that has shaped the world that we live in and is continued to form the basis of how we view this part of the world in American foreign policy. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Katya. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Uh, the last point from me is that I want to draw your attention to some of the publications that we brought with us today. You know that the Kennan Institute has been on the ground since 1999, and it was led by um, my predecessor, Dr. Yaroslav Pilinski, who has uh, launched our academic journal called Agara, we brought with us some old copies of the Agora and some of the articles published there, they still have relevance today. And we, starting from this year, we relaunched Agora. It has changed its design. Uh, and the first issue uh, is devoted to museums and cultural diplomacy, which, as you know, is getting prominence in, in Ukraine as a new concept, uh, vigorously introduced and promoted by the Ukrainian government, both the culture and foreign, uh, foreign affairs ministry. So here are the old copies of Agora, and here is a book that was 
uh, written uh, by uh, Kennan Institute former director, uh, Dr. Blair Rubel. So at this point, all my introductions about the Kennan Institute, its official and administrative role are over. And I would like to uh, ask you to mentally get transformed like um, 60, 70 years back when some of us, and certainly me, Witness the period of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And I remember as a, as a, as a little kid, I genuinely believed that the nuclear war uh, is, the threat of the nuclear war is imminent, and that one day the hostile American government led by uh, Reagan administration will start the war with the Soviet Union. And the tensions between our two countries have been so strong that on a daily basis, you know, the propaganda message had been warning us about the, the, the danger that is still in. Uh, so that was a period, that was the time when George Kinnan lived, and he was the one who kept thinking on a daily basis on how to avoid the war and what the U.S. government should do about the Soviet Union and how to make sure that the, globally this will be a much more safer and better world for everyone. When George Kinnan died, and he had lived a very happy and long life, he died at the age of 101 years old on March 17th, but this obituary to him had been published one month later. Uh, the Guardian newspaper uh, said that there are not many people who can be said to have changed the shape of the age they lived in, but the American diplomat George Kinnan, who had died aged 101, was certainly one of them. Virtually single-handedly, he established the policy which controlled both sides of the Cold War for more than 40 years. Isaiah Berlin, the name I believe some of you know, uh, is a scholar from Oxford, philosopher, uh, also served as a diplomat at some point in his career, uh, has also this beautiful quote about Cannon. I was, in a way, astonished. He was not at all like the people in the State Department and you in Washington. He was more thoughtful and more melancholy. He was terribly absorbed, personally involved, somehow in the terrible nature of the Stalin regime and in the convolutions of his policy. Another two articles, uh, quotes from Berlin, his books and articles contained more ideas per page and more freshness and directness of vision than most academic publications. He seemed to me to be a man of unique distinction of mind and remarkable, sometimes rather mysterious intellectual processes leading to original conclusions. Moreover, he has that rarest of all possessions, something to say. <laughs> and finally, Henry Kissinger, who uh, as a former state uh, secretary could professionally evaluate every idea that had been presented by Kinnan, uh, published upon evaluating George, one of George Kinnan's books, said that the George Kinnan came as close to authoring the diplomatic doctrine of his era as any diplomat in our history. So having presented all these beautiful quotes about Kinnan, you must now wonder like, what, what was so special about him and uh, uh, why we remember him today and why there is an institute under his name in Washington, D.C. If one day you would want to learn more about Kinnan, I would strongly recommend you find uh, either here in Kiev or in American libraries the book which had been written by John Lewis Gaddis, an uh, American historian, a Princeton professor who had been studying the Cold War history for more than 30 years, who had been teaching the subject at Princeton, and who had spent 30 years writing uh, Kennan's biography, the book that he published in 2011, and the book that won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for uh, biography and autobiography. Uh, Gaddis's book was particularly praised because he, as a historian, has demonstrated a unique um, quality. Not every historian these days is capable of really preserving him or herself to the neutrality and trying not to judge uh, the character about he or she writes from the position of the present day. In uh, his book, Gadi says that biographers have an obligation to place their subjects within the period in which they lived. It is unfair to condemn them for not knowing what no one at that time could have known. George Kinnan was born um, in uh, 1904 to a family of um, a tax lawyer uh, Koshut Kennan, 
Uh, he was born in a Midwest state, Wisconsin. Uh, but he, in his memoirs, kept saying that he didn't have only one father, that he had three fathers. One, of course, was his natural dad, but the second father was his um, distant relative, the brother of his grandfather, who also was named George Kinnan, and who traveled extensively to Russia, who was a member of the big um, American-Russian exhibition, ex, 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 uh, study trip to Siberia, uh, who published immensely, and who uh, had presented upon his return to the United States more than 800 lectures about Russia, and who has established the reputation of being an expert in Russia. Uh, George Kinnan, the senior, in his letter to George Kinnan's father, himself acknowledged uh, that he feels a certain uh, personal and emotional bond to uh, this child just who was just born, and uh, that he hopes that one day the child will become as interested in Russia as he himself was during his career. You have a son who bears my name. It would be a great satisfaction to me if I could feel that certain things which I have personal or historical interest and which have been closely associated with my work could be transferred to him when he becomes old enough to understand them and take an interest in them. And this bond was in, indeed reciprocal because when George Kinnan uh, grew up, he, in his memoirs, uh, devoted a number of pages to his relative. And he wrote that both of us devoted large portions of our adult life to Russia and her problems. We were both expelled from Russia by the Russian governments of our day. Both of us founded organizations to assist refugees from Russian despotism. Both wrote and lectured profusely. Both played the guitar. Both eventually became members of the National Institute of Arts and Letters. And the third person whom Kennan believed was his dad was surprisingly a Russian uh, writer, Anton Chekhov, whom he absolutely adored. And when he started lecturing himself and he developed a reputation as a big expert in Russia, he traveled all over the United States. Some scholars now uh, write that he would spend instead of talking about the Cold War and about containment, he could speak for uh, one hour about Chekhov instead of uh, about containment theory. Uh, George Kinnan um, became a student of Princeton University in 1921. Uh, he studied foreign languages there, uh, international politics, uh, history, and uh, it should be said that he was not a brilliant student because he ranked only 83rd in a group of 215 uh, students. He was a very melancholy um, and uh, sanguine uh, young man. Interestingly enough, when uh, his group graduated from Princeton in 1925, he didn't attend any ceremony to celebrate uh, the receipt of diploma. He only came to the official part to when the diploma itself was being given to him, but he didn't want to have any kind of social interaction with his fellow students. Uh, he originally thought of becoming a lawyer and wanted to get a master's degree uh, in law from Princeton, but the cost of education was so high and his family was probably not capable of affording the, the law school, that he, uh, upon having discussed it with his professors, decided to, to start a career in foreign service. It happened so that by the time he graduated in 1925, uh, the Congress has adopted a new legislative bill which merged two, at that time, separate uh, institutions in the U.S. government, the U.S. diplomatic uh, service and the U.S. consular service and the State Department as an institution we know which today had been uh, established and it started working on its procedures and helping young graduates of universities to develop their professional careers. Uh, Kinnan spent eight months uh, at the State Department foreign, foreign school being, getting prepared for a career as a diplomat and um, in uh, 1926, on September 9th, he was appointed to the rank of Foreign Service Officer, unclassified. I don't have to explain to some of the embassy people here what unclassified means. It means that he uh, couldn't have access to classified documents. He didn't have yet 
uh, developed a reputation of a trusted enough diplomat to be given access to top secrets. Uh, but his salary at that time was only two thousand uh, five hundred dollars, which is by today's uh, uh, means is of course not very high. But that's how much uh, young career professionals uh, were paid at, at that time. Uh, Kinnan's first diplomatic appointments were to uh, Geneva. He served there as a vice consul, and then to Hamburg, uh, Germany. And uh, having spent two years in academics in in the diplomatic service, he even considered quitting his job because uh, of his probable character. He had a girlfriend in the states who got married and. Uh, she sent him a letter saying that because he was abroad for so long, she could no longer uh, kind of wait for him to get back. And probably this combination of personal and professional reasons led him to the idea that he should quit the foreign service. And he even submitted a letter of resignation. But because he hasn't officially stated what was the reason for resignation, the people in charge of the human resources department wanted to double check Keenan's professional standard and all the uh, professional recommendations that he received, they were very strongly in support of him to continue the professional development. And thus, the, the State Department has often offered him a unique deal. Uh, he was given a chance to study four, one, one out of four foreign languages, either Chinese, Japanese, Arabic, or Russian. Uh, the State Department would pay for three years of his postdoctorate -doc degree at one of the European universities, and he would basically be doing what he wants to do intellectually and still keep his salary. And definitely for a person of Kinnan's intellectual capacity, that was a very good offer. And he gladly, um, gladly accepted it. Uh, and he uh, moved to Berlin during what today is known as a uh, Humboldt University. And it, out of those four languages that he was offered for choice, Arabic, Chinese, uh, or Russian, he uh, chose Russian just because he felt that he owes his old relative and because he also hoped that one day the United States and the Soviet Union will reestablish diplomatic relations and that one day his skill as a, uh, his Russian skill will be used. But here I'm um, giving you a very good uh, quote which explains how Kinnan himself perceived a uh, diplomatic uh, career and what he believed was the key qualification that every diplomat must possess. Uh, the only useful preparation for diplomacy came from history, he said, as well as from the more subtle and revealing expressions of man's nature found in art and literature. Students should be reading their Bible and their Shakespeare, their Plutarch and their Gibbon, perhaps even their Latin and their Greek. These alone would build those qualities of honor, loyalty, generosity, and consideration of others that had been the basis for effectiveness in the foreign service as I have known it. So here is a, a photograph from 1929 of uh, the today's Humboldt Universities, at that time Friedrich Wilhelm University of Berlin, where Kinnan spent almost three years studying Russian, first at the university, but because uh, prior to coming to Berlin he lived in, in uh, the Baltic states, in Riga and Tallinn, his Russian was already good enough. So he passed all his exams very quickly, just within one year. And he spent the rest of his time in Berlin simply reading Russian, uh, Russian literature in original, learning more about Russian past. And uh, I think this helped him more to become a real expert in Russia than uh, studying any other theoretic subject on foreign relations. Also here in Berlin, he, he met Anna Elisa Kennan, or just Annelise Kennan, uh, a Norwegian citizen uh, whom he married uh, shortly before getting back to the United States. Here is a photograph of uh, his family. This photograph was taken uh, when George Kinnan got his first appointment uh, to uh, the Soviet Union in 1933. But how did Kinnan finally make it to the Soviet Union? Do you remember that the last uh, US ambassador to Russia left uh, what was then uh, to become a Soviet Union in 1918. The United States broke diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. 
And some uh, people in the Foreign Service, they kept lobbying for the need to re-establish this relationship, especially because uh, the Soviet Union was a big market and the American businessmen wanted to have access to this market. So despite all ideological differences, sooner or later, these diplomatic relations had to be re-established. And the person who helped to establish or re-establish these relations was Ambassador William Bullitt, who first worked with President Woodrow Wilson, who was already mentioned by Will today, a uh, big intellectual, uh, who helped uh, Woodrow Wilson at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. And he himself undertook a special mission to Soviet Russia to ne negotiate diplomatic relations between the United States and the Bolshevik regime. But he failed at that time to convince Wilson to support the uh, reestablishment of relations with the Soviet Union. However, the president who um, replaced uh, Woodrow Wilson, Frank Franklin Roosevelt uh, did appoint uh, Bullitt, the first US ambassador to the Soviet Union, the post he held for three years in 1933 and 1936. Uh, Bullitt arrived in the Soviet Union with very high expectations for the Russian America, for Soviet American relations, but by the end of his tenure, he was openly hostile uh, to the Soviet government and remained an outspoken anti-communist for the rest of his life. But his meeting with Kinnan was really a good um, uh, chance of luck for Kinnan because he came to the State Department with a colleague and uh, as a colleague they, in a cafeteria started discussing Kinnan's uh, career after he finished his uh, uh, courses of Russian in Berlin, and the friend recommended Kinnan to talk to Bullitt, who was just appointed an ambassador and who would literally leave to the Soviet Union within the next two days. And Bullitt um, luckily was at the office. Kinnan could literally come in out of the door and uh, to discuss with him some of the economic and political relations uh, in the internal domestic uh, affairs of the Soviet Union. And Bullitt was so much impressed by the depth of Kinnan's understanding of uh, Soviet and Russian uh, current and past affairs that he immediately uh, offered him a position uh, and asked a very simple question, are you ready to travel with me to Moscow tomorrow? And Kinnan said, yes, uh, sir, I, I, will, I will come with you. So this acquaintance was really a stroke of good luck uh, for Kinnan. And uh, here is the next slide where you see on December 11th, 1933, when the newly appointed ambassador and uh, uh, Kalinin at the time uh, had uh, the post of uh, speaker of the Soviet Supreme Rada, or what do you call it? So we was officially having the post of the Soviet president, uh, Soviet, the Soviet, Sovietsky Soviet. So uh, you see at the at the back there is a, uh, the, you see Bullet with Kalinin, and then uh, Cannon is also uh, the third person on this picture. So uh, it is indeed during those first two years that that Cannon spent in Moscow that he acquired all the necessary administrative skills which helped him later uh, to be an efficient um, uh, diplomat uh, when he himself was appointed an ambassador. Because they had to start the embassy from scratch, you know, they had to develop um, all the logistics, all the administrative processes. It was, a, I believe, a remarkable, a very interesting in, a experience to be the first, new, to be the newcomers into this new country. And that by that time, imagine the size of the U.S. embassy. It had only three uh, diplomats, you know, and, and Kennan was one of those three courageous men who joined Ambassador Bullitt in his appointment. But later in 1936, when uh, Ambassador Bullitt got a position in Paris, he was appointed uh, uh, ambassador to Paris, um, Kennan kind of lost his best friend, he lost his mentor, and he wanted to start doing something else, so he requested that the State Department moves him uh, to, uh, back to the United States. Years later, however, during the Second World War in 1944, he had the chance to get back to uh, the Soviet Union, already in a position of uh, charge as deputy chief of mission, what we would call today, and he was invited by the famous Ambassador Harriman, 
those of you who are familiar with Columbia University, you know that there is a Hariman Institute at Columbia which studies Russia, Soviet past, and Ukraine. So it is named after the, Dr. Hariman, who was also at some time uh, George Kinnan's boss. Uh, the document which helped George Kinnan to develop his professional reputation was the so-called long telegram. Uh, there is a lot of mystification about the long telegram because some people claim it was a document as long as 8,000 words, uh, although in reality it was slightly more than 5,000 words. Some claim uh, that Keenan had been planning to write this document for many months and years. Others believe that it was a pure coincidence because um, Ambassador uh, Hariman, who was not in Moscow at the time, who would have written a, a report like this himself had he been available at the moment. But the report was sent to Washington upon personal request of President Truman, who uh, required the embassy's explanation of what's going on with the Soviet Union and why, surprisingly, uh, having been offered to join the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, the new institutions that have been created, international organization created in 1946, why all of a sudden Russia and the Soviet Union at that time decided not to. So Kinnan um, has uh, spent the night at his office writing the document and he started with an apology. Uh, I apologize in advance for this burdening of telegraphic channel, but questions involved are of such urgent importance, particularly in view of recent events, that our answers to them, if they deserve attention at all, seem to me uh, to deserve it all at once. So he sends this, uh, we've calculated with Will today, so how many pages is 5,500 words? So we uh, realize that it's almost 15 or 20 pages of uh, explaining everything that's going on in present day Soviet Union by taking into consideration the years of uh, Russian uh, imperial history, which Kinnan knew so well. So in the, the main uh, arguments of the long telegram were as follows. Kinnan claims that at the bottom of Kremlin's neurotic view of world affairs is the traditional and instinctive Russian sense of insecurity. He claimed that after the Russian Revolution, the sense of insecurity became mixed with communism ideology and oriental secretiveness and conspiracy of the uh, uh, Soviet leaders. Uh, at the same time, this uh, state of affairs didn't represent the natural outlook of the Russian people who are, by and large, friendly to the outside world, eager for experience of it, eager to measure against it the talents they're conscious of possessing, eager above all to live in peace and enjoy the fruits of their own labor. Uh, but there is a good reason to suspect that this government is actually a conspiracy within a conspiracy, and I, for one, am reluctant to believe that Stalin himself receives anything like an objective picture of the outside world. Uh, he claimed that Soviet international behavior dependent mainly on the internal necessities of the Stalin's regime who needed a hostile world around him in order to legitimize his uh, autocratic rule from inside. Uh, the dictatorship without which they didn't know how to rule, for cruelties they didn't dare not to inflict. Uh, as a solution to, to this state of affairs, Kinnan recommended the U.S. government follows the following path. The most effective American response to this situation dependent on the health of its own society. Europeans exhausted and frightened in the wake of the war, we are less interested in abstract freedom than in security. He realized that after the Second World War, uh, the Europe, which was an, an economic crisis itself, would not have neither physical, no, no, no kind of moral, no uh, economic power to uh, fight a war with the Soviet Union if this war would one day become a reality. So we must have courage and self-confidence to cling to our own methods and conceptions of human society and serve as a role model to inspire our European partners and to inspire those in the Soviet Union who would be able to get our message somehow. Uh, years later, 
uh, oh, not years, literally only one year later when Kinnan came back to um, the United States, and I should say that the long telegram that he sent clearly uh, got a lot of attention at the State Department. It was read widely, not only at the State Department, but also at other uh, uh, governmental institutions in the United States, people who have been involved in the national security issues. And um, he had established a reputation as someone who really knows what he is talking about. Uh, so Keenan. Uh, reworked the long telegram and he put it into an article. Uh, some uh, scholars these days, and Will Pomeranz is one of them, says that I would wish I could have a career having written only one article. You know, this is really, uh, this is really a remarkable achievement. You write on one article and they talk about your article for, for the rest of your life. So Keenan who couldn't publish his article under his own name uh, because he was a US diplomat and uh, under the dip diplomatic procedure, uh, it would be uh, recommended not to publish under your own name. So the article was written by somebody named Mr. X. So the Mr. X published this article in Foreign Affairs titled The Sources of Soviet Conduct. Uh, the argument of the article was that the main element of any United States policy towards the Soviet Union must be a long-term, patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. Soviet pressure against the free institutions of the West can be contained by the vigilant application of counterforce at a series of constantly shifting geographical and political points corresponding to the shifts and maneuvers of Soviet policy. So what Kedan, in very simple words, proposed is that there is a third way to deal with Russia. You don't necessarily have to fight a war with Russia, especially having just finished the Second World War and uh, having no economic, as I said, political and financial means to start a war if necessary. No one wants to die in, in the Third World War. Uh, at the same time, you don't have to make concessions to Stalin because giving concessions to Stalin would, mil would mean denial of your own ideals, denials of your own position, uh, the position that you believe is right. So instead of kind of involving in taking either one or the second path, you take the third path and just wait and see for the moment when the Soviet Union will destroy itself from within, because there are so many contradictions within the Soviet system. Uh, there is such a huge gap between ordinary Soviet citizens and uh, the, the ideas which are imposed upon them by the Soviet rulers that sooner or later the system will just collapse and all the Soviet, uh, all the foreign uh, governments have to do, they need to wait that the Soviet society either itself will overthrow the government, which is uh, authoritarian in its nature, or there will be a new democratic leader who will um, change uh, the situation within Politburo and we remember that eventually what Canon um, proposed came through with Gorbachev being elected as a new Soviet leader and assisting in dissolving the Soviet empire. Uh, as I said, containment, as Kinnan had conceived it, never required action from the outside to change the internal character of the Soviet system. That was to happen from within, from visionaries, uh, dissidents who would have the courage to respond to these new uh, circumstances. So having published the article, and as I said, having presented uh, the long telegram, Kinnan, uh, all of a sudden became extremely popular in Washington DC. Everyone wanted to uh, get introduced to this new expert on the Soviet Union. And as George Kinnan himself wrote in his diaries, my reputation was made, my voice is now carried. I seem to have hit the jackpot as a Russian expert. Harvard, Princeton, and Yale had all asked me to join their faculties. However, uh, State Secretary, uh, Marshall uh, had a better career offer to Kinnan rather than an academic offer. At that time, uh, he had created the policy planning department, which is considered to be the first think tank within the State Department. Uh, the new institution, new uh, uh, institution established to uh, think ahead of events before they evolve. 
and Keenan, um, under George Marshall as Secretary of State, was uh, more influential than he was at any other period of his career, in between 1947 to 1948. Uh, uh, Secretary of State Marshall valued his strategic sense and had him create and direct what is now named the policy planning staff. Uh, he became his first director and uh, he played the central role in drafting the Marshall Plan. Uh, when George Keenan was the director of the policy planning staff, his um, staff members has uh, produced more than 70 uh, strategic papers. In total, it was almost 1,000 pages uh, which had been written and read widely by the State Department. That's a lot of work. As people who work in the U.S. think tank, we understand that it took a, a great intellectual effort to produce uh, such a coherent uh, policy uh, programs. But the first document which George Keenan uh, produced upon uh, George Marshall's uh, request was the policy with respect to American aid to Western Europe, which is now known as the Marshall Plan. And uh, when two gentlemen discussed uh, how the, the document should be presented and uh, what it should contain, George Kinnan received only two words of strategic advice from uh, George Marshall, and those two uh, key words were avoid trivia. So, so this Having received this uh, uh, recommendation, uh, Keenan produced the Marshall Plan and recommended that the United States give a tremendous financial and economic assistance to the Western Europe, which was in ruins after the Second World War, and to help it sustain itself from the th imminent threat of communism being spread to the rest of the Western civilization. On this photograph, you see uh, President Truman, Keenan, and other members of uh, the Foreign Service discussing uh, the trends uh, in the U.S. foreign policy. So the whole idea behind the pol policy planning department was to look ahead, not into the distant future, but beyond the vision of the operating officers caught in the smoke and crisis of current battle, far enough ahead to see the emerging form of things to come and outline what should be done to meet or anticipate them. So the essence of the Marshall Plan, and here is a quote from George Marshall himself from the speech he delivered at Harvard University on June 5, 1947, was the, the policy directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. Uh, its purpose should be uh, the revival of a working economy in the world so as to permit the emergence of political and social conditions upon which free institutions can exist. Uh, the highest point which George Keenan uh, reached in his, during his professional career was, of course, his appointment as ambassador to uh, the Soviet Union. It happened in March 1942, uh, when the news about his appointment spread in uh, Washington quarters. Uh, American newspapers wrote that George Kinnan was probably the one who knows as much about Russia's history, literature, and national characteristics as many members of the Politburo. And he was the first um, US uh, diplomat not to need an interpreter when meeting with Stalin. However, uh, the skill, uh, Ambassador Kinnan could never practice in a meeting with Stalin because when he arrived, Stalin intentionally refused to meet with uh, the U.S. ambassador. And uh, when he arrived after more than 10 years, uh, when he didn't been to Russia and the Soviet Union, Kinnan was impressed how changed, uh, how different it was. There were so many advertisements, all these hostile messages that the, so, that the United States is a hostile country. He himself was characterized by the newspaper Pravda as a spy, as a tool of Wall Street, as warmonger, monger, as a mm -hmm. warmonger, and all this very bad uh, vocabulary, you know, that Keenan, as a very emotional person, took very personally. 
uh, there were a number of episodes which put uh, Keenan personally as an ambassador in a very uncomfortable position. First of all, within the embassy, he had discovered a lot of uh, bugs, you know, devices. So the embassy realized that it was under constant monitoring. He felt that all uh, s local staff that worked for them at the embassy, they were uh, spies eventually, had been controlling every move. And then the last drop, you know, that had uh, changed his uh, disposition toward the Soviet Union was an episode with his son who played uh, uh, in the courtyard and climbed the fence to look outside what's behind the embassy, what's going on on the street. And as soon as he looked uh, outside of the fence, the other kids who'd been playing uh, and who started exchanging very pleasant uh, conversation with him, uh, the parents of those kids, fearful that this can somehow, the, the very fact that kids interact with each other, that this, this can have negative repercussions on their families. They took the kids away, the uh, child started to cry, and Kinnan realized that the Cold War, you know, is not something that's going on only in newspapers and on propagandistic messages, that the Cold War is already penetrating the youngest, you know, members of the uh, Soviet Union. So since he had never had the chance to meet Stalin, and from his office who could see the Kremlin, uh, this photograph is a wonderful illustration you know, of, of, this lonely, of this lonely ambassador who lives there by himself, who has no access to uh, the Soviet government, who f probably feels himself as a completely useless person because he can do nothing in, in this situation. And under this emotional state, when uh, Keenan traveled to London on business, he was interviewed upon arrival by a local journalist, and he thought that he was giving those comments uh, off the record, you know, that they won't be published. But unfortunately, the quotes that he gave was recorded, and it was published by the, the newspaper, New York Times, which reported that George Keenan, US ambassador to the Soviet Union, declared today that he and other Western diplomats resided in Moscow in an icy cold atmosphere of isolation so complete that he could not talk even to his guides or servants except on simple business. His isolation in the Soviet capital today is worse than he experienced as an interned U.S. diplomat in Germany after Pearl Harbor when the Nazis declared war on the United States. Years later, when he uh, thought back about this episode, he deeply regretted what he said. He felt that um, it was a mistake to say something like this, uh, because the days after the New York Times published this interview with him, Pravda uh, re responded and said that the only, only a person who cannot hold back his malicious hostility to the Soviet Union could talk uh, this way who not only doesn't want an improvement in American-Soviet relations, but is making use of any opportunity to make those relations worse. Uh, so Kinnan was declared persona non grata for having made slanderous attacks hostile to the Soviet Union in a rude violation of generally recognized norms of educational law. And um, the Soviet government required immediate um, recall, and so far, uh, Kinnan is the only, uh, has been the only U.S. diplomat who, during the 20, 230 years of the Russian-American diplomatic relations, had been expelled from Russia for making this, for making this comment. Uh, it was uh, Soviet diplomat Andrei Vyshinsky who um, informed the U.S. Embassy uh, about the decision of the Soviet government to expel, expel Kinnan. At heart, I was deeply shamed uh, and shaken by what have, had occurred. I was probably too highly uh, strung emotionally, too imaginative, too sensitive, and too impressed with the importance of my own opinions to sit quietly uh, on that particular seat. For this, one needed a certain phlegm, a certain con contentment with the trivia of diplomatic life. However, Kinnan himself was not this type of person. And uh, he, what happened, oops, what happened, happened. Uh, nevertheless, in his memoirs years later, he uh, acknowledged that uh, when he reflected, he believed that this episode has changed his life a lot 
and that God always has its providence and probably it had to be going in this direction because being freed from the State Department and from the diplomatic career, Kennan had a chance to produce his 17 wonderful books and who also developed a reputation not only as a diplomat, but also as a scholar. Uh, John Gaddis writes uh, in his book, uh, frankly, when I was reading the uh, biography of Kennan, that was the saddest the saddest chapter, you know, when he discusses how Kinnan, after having spent 27 years of professional career as a diplomat, his last days at the State Department, definitely it was a scandal, and definitely a lot of people at the State Department felt very bad that the U.S. ambassador had to be expelled from the Soviet Union, and no offer was given to him uh, uh, when he returned back to the United States. And by the so American diplomatic rules, if the diplomat is not given a, a different, a new post within three months, uh, he or she has to retire or resign because there is no other opportunity for you to go either to a different country or to get a position within the State Department. So uh, as Gaddis characterizes uh, Kinnan's exit from the State Department, that it was an inglorious conclusion to an illustrious career. No foreign service officer had advanced more rapidly within its ranks. None had more significantly shaped grand strategy at the highest levels of government. None had created, if inadvertently, the school of international relations theory. And yet Keenan worked out of the State Department on July 29, 1953, with hardly anyone noticing. He was by himself at the elevator that took him downstairs and he um, became finally, as he said, a retired officer, a private citizen. Kinnan said he, he was happy on that day. However, we can understand that, that he was probably not 100% sincere with us when he published this quote. So after resignation, Kinnan joined the Institute for Advanced Study. He also served as a professor of history at Princeton University. He published, as I said, 17 books. Uh, and one of his books, Russia Leaves the War, published in 1956, won a Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Uh, and he received a number of other literary awards for really beautiful prose that he produced over the terms of his career. He also had an opportunity to serve as an ambassador once again. I've, I forgot to mention that when Kinnan spent uh, some time in Prague, it was his first opportunity to meet young gentleman with the last name Kennedy, who was at the time a son of the US ambassador to the Great Britain. He was, his dad was also a political appointee. And he said his son, uh, John Kennedy, to in fact find a mission to the Czech Republic, which at that time, do you remember, was occupied. The Sudetans were occupied by the Nazi Germany. Uh, and uh, he, as a diplomat, for the first time interacted with the student. So when Kennedy himself was appointed, uh, was elected the president, he offered Kinnan uh, the position of ambassador to Yugoslavia. But Kinnan himself believed that this was a failed ambassadorship because uh, all his ideas of promoting Yugoslavia and ensuring that among all communist states of Eastern Europe, Yugoslavia would have a special status with its relation with the Soviet Union were not supported in Congress. And President Kennedy had always had to fight the war with the Congress over the recommendation that he received from uh, George Kinnan. Kinnan very strongly supported the idea of organizing Tito's uh, visit to the United States. However, it was also very unsuccessful because protests have been organized in front of the United Nations building. And uh, everyone, especially in the US government, was embarrassed you know, to allow a communist leader to arrive uh, at this particular moment um, in uh, the United States. But the last uh, uh, episode which I'd like to share with you tonight about George Kinnan's buyer is his relationships with uh, Svetlana Aleluyeva, uh, Stalin's daughter, who appeared on the night of March 6, 1967 at the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi and requested political asylum and uh, who claimed that she has a manuscript of the book she wrote, her memoirs about her dad, which he wants to publish in the United States. And Kinnan is one who spoke fluent Russian, who could uh, 
verify and who could un understand and qualify the um, richness and material that she produced was asked to provide recommendations on the book. So when he received the book from through diplomatic channels, he was uh, he liked the book very much, and he uh, literally said that this document is worth several thousand millions, probably U.S. dollars, because as soon as you publish something like this in the United States, Shlana Eliluva will grow into a literary star, and everyone would want to talk to her. So he himself traveled to bring her to uh, the United States, to Princeton. He introduced her to everyone in Princeton, and they have developed very close friendly relationship. She was a frequent guest to Kenan's house um, and they exchanged and helped each other to uh, come to terms with themselves because Kenan also had his personal issues. He had his uh, um, inner intellectual process and Ali Luiva, someone who knew him deeply, his psychology helped him to um, come to terms with his new intellectual life in Princeton as well. But I'd like to end uh, today's presentation with a quote from Svetlana Aliluiva's uh, uh, discussions with Kinnan, which I believe uh, have their relevance today, because both of them uh, uh, studied Russian past, both of them knew what the uh, Soviet Union was all about, and both of them could agree uh, about what makes the essence of the Russian and the Soviet regime. I'm sorry for a small letters, but I will read them for you. The absolute power of a single man, his power over thoughts as well as actions, the utter disenfranchisement and helplessness of the popular masses, the nervous punishment of innocent people for the offenses they might be considered capable of committing rather than the ones they had committed, the neurotic relationship to the West, the frantic fear of foreign observation, the obsession with espionage, the secrecy, the systematic mystification, the general silence of intimidation, the preoccupation with appearances at the expense of reality, the systematic cultivation of falsehood as a weapon of policy, the tendency to rewrite the past. Uh, so I believe that this quote alone explains that Kennan was in, indeed a visionary, uh, that uh, the document that he produced uh, are not only great by the intellectual um, uh, ideas that they contain, that it's a great prose, and that we are fortunate as representatives of the Kennan Institute to continue his legacy, to study his legacy, and to share all this intellectual legacy with you tonight. Thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> and I hope that um, either me or Will will help me to answer your questions because I must confess that I am not an expert on the Cold War era, and I am not an expert on George Kennan. I just uh, felt obliged to prepare a lecture about him because I felt that as a, being appointed as a director of the Kennan Institute in Kiev, that there is not much in, information about George Kennan, and even people who study foreign relations and diplomacy, they don't know much uh, about him. However, uh, uh, the Verkhovna Rada Foreign Relations Committee, they even came to us and proposed we organize a round table to discuss uh, George Kinnan's uh, legacy. So this presentation, which will be available on our channel on YouTube, will hopefully fill this vacuum and fill this niche and students of foreign relations and foreign policy uh, and the US-Soviet uh, relations will have this source to uh, get inspired and to learn more about the subject. Thank you. Well, do you have anything to add no, to this? No, I think we <laughs> covered a lot of territory and <laughs> I think we'd be happy uh, and Katya would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yes. Um, okay, can I ask you about the, um, the Wilson Center itself? <laughs> because I have not heard about the Kiev office and I was wondering what is it that you do? How do you bring together uh, practitioners and scholars, how is it related to the center in the U.S. and such, <laughs> just briefly. Well, 
first of all, I have to draw your attention to the fact that some of our alumni are present here today. I already introduced Natalia Musienka to you. There is also Natalia Vysotska, professor of the Kiev State Linguistic University. Here is uh, our Dr. Pavlo Kirpenko, who used to teach uh, foreign uh, relations at the Kiev Institute of International Relations, a great experts on Afghanistan and the U.S.-Afghani relations. Uh, we have now a, a group of almost 100 alumni, Ukrainian scholars who had the chance to be in the United States at the Woodrow Wilson Center either on a short-term scholarships from one to three months or on a long-term scholarships uh, which been funded within the Fulbright program in Ukraine. I myself, a graduate of the Fulbright uh, program, I was fortunate with my colleagues to spend six months in Washington DC and develop my research proposal and publish a book upon return. So here we um, really try to establish a venue for our scholars to present uh, all the material that they study in the United States to link their research to present day needs of Ukrainian government, to its reform agenda, and to really promote the development of Ukrainian academia, you know, to make the connection between the, our academia and the international academia uh, closely, and just to keep the fire burning. You know, we, need, we need this intellectual inspiration, and I believe the more people uh, know about the Canon Institute, the more they understand the value that the Canon Institute and the Woodrow Wilson Center carries with it, uh, the greater and the stronger Ukrainian academia will become. Because they not only help uh, the local government to shape uh, their policies for the future. They also help politicians and uh, scholars in the United States who study the region, who study Ukraine and Russia to get a better understanding of what's going on. They, they continuously interviewed when they are in the, in the United States. So it's really the concept of soft power, you know, of people-to-people of, uh, -people diplomacy that our institute is uh, performing. I think Katya's given a very complete answer. I just, <laughs> the one thing I would emphasize is I think when we, we began the Foreign Office, or the office in Kiev and other offices, and our other office in Russia, I think one of our main goals was, uh, because of the isolation of the Soviet period, to integrate Ukrainian and Russian scholars into an international community, and to give them that opportunity to establish connections, but also understand how the social sciences and humanities has evolved over some 70 years and begin to integrate them and connect them with that network. I think that was another crucial part of the goal of creating this office, uh, was to make sure that we didn't lose touch with our alumni. So what do you do now with your Russian? Uh, um, because of a variety of reasons, uh, we, were no, uh, no, we no longer have a Russian office. Uh, we do have a representative in Russia, and uh, we continue to try and conduct programming as best we can uh, dealing with Russia, but, it, but in it, what forms? I mean, again, other than Skype or whatever. No, we, <laughs> we've, we've tried. We've, we've been able to have a few uh, conferences inside Russia. Still, um, we still have scholars that come through various grant programs to the Kennan Institute and study in the United States. Um, we have done our best to continue to keep our alumni network involved and engaged. Um, but over the past uh, three years. Uh, new challenges obviously have emerged, which has made it much more difficult uh, to continue that mission. Um, but again, it remains our goal, uh, and we have invested a lot of efforts and resources to try to keep, as best we can, Russians engaged in international dialogue as well. Can I make something to say? I would like to say, if you take contemporary Russian science or international relations, you can see the old myths of Russian science and propaganda are still alive. For example, if we take the latest books and read about the Soviet policy on the eve of the Second World War and the role of the Soviet Union in unleashing this war, we can see that the contemporary Russia has not gone much or far away from the explanations and concepts which were official in the Soviet Union. Still. That's why they are building new monuments to Mr. Stalin at the moment. Are they? Are they really? <laughs> <laughs> 
neighborhood there. I don't think this question really needs to be answered. But no, but it, it again highlights the insights that Kennan himself brought to the table <laughs> um, and why we continue to talk about the legacy of George Kennan because uh, some, ac some academics, the words are only true for their period or their lifetime. But Kennan's uh, words and thoughts have had uh, a, a lasting, have made a lasting contribution, and still are uh, cited and engaged on a variety of sides. I should add uh, today, and that's what makes uh, Kennan such an influential thinker, and why a Kennan Institute remains necessary uh, to continue to talk about those ideas. Colleagues, I have to apologize because. Today we have another important event in town, so we have to kind of put an end at this point. And we hope that you will join uh, us next week, when exactly on this date, on Thursday at five o'clock, Dr. Musiyanka will uh, talk about cultural diplomacy and will um, explain to you in a very step-by-step um, -step way how to set up an, an, a, a professional and very successful exhibition uh, which is now considered to be the gem of the Ukrainian cultural diplomacy process. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Till, see you next time. <laughs>